Hey, what's up guys? You're listening to a Fick Tan segment, and this is going to be a bit of a weird one, because this is the first time we have deliberately recorded a Fick Tan, rather than it just being a tangential dialogue from a main episode. You also notice Izzy is not joining us today, but she said we should go ahead and record it anyway, so here we are. Once upon a time our teacher said, you never break the rules that we define. So, Algica Sathalon. This is something I wanted to talk about in relation to 17776 because they are very tangentially similar. They're both <laughs> they both have to do with weird absurdist sports, personification, and colors. But whereas in 17776, there are personified space probes with who talk in different <laughs> colored text to indicate who's speaking, in Algic Asathalon, the colors are what are personified. They're personified as, like, stick figures with the name and color that they represent. They're colored stick figures that are named after the color they are, I guess. Yeah. Or are, yeah, you, you could look at it both ways. The basic idea with Algic Asathalon, and... I kind of went at this backwards because Bela introduced me to this concept, this area of YouTube, and then I kind of independently rededuced who had made it. This was originated by Carrie KH of the Huang twins, uh, Michael and Carrie Huang. Carrie's whole thing is like algorithmic storytelling, genetic algorithms, and using AIs to generate content back before it was cool. <laughs> Uh, he also made a whole bunch of Flash games back in the day, and Algic Asathalon fits right into that, where it's a lot like his other project, Battle for Dream, one of his other projects, Battle for Dream Island, which is a bunch of personified random objects. I think it might have started as randomized or personified emojis. In any case, it's a very similar thing genre-wise. A whole bunch of trials that have survivors, that have people getting voted out, and it's all kind of user interactive and kind of randomly or algorithmically determined. In this case, Algic Asathalon is determined by ragdoll physics. Yes. Yes. So there is a program, there's a software called Algadoo. It's a free-to-use physics-based 2D software for... Um, it's meant to uh, be like a teaching tool for children learning about physics. So you're able to very easily use it and develop these sort of basically obstacle courses for these stick figure characters to move through in some way or another. And there are different types of events. The most iconic one, I think, is the uh, race to the bull, as it's called, which is like these two paddles flipping a bunch of the stick figures up <laughs> randomly, and the first ones to get into the bull are the winners, and the last one loses. And so the way that it's presented, though, is as if there's some intentionality throughout it all, like as if these are athletes competing against each other. They're sometimes referred to as marbles. I don't know if that's like their, the name of the species, but... I'm seeing several other videos on his channel called The Amazing Marble Race, and it's got seasons and legs of the season or episodes. And, and it's basically the same thing, except each stick figure is reduced to just its head, representationally. Yeah. And so, yeah, you might have, like, a race to the bull, you might have BMX cycling courses that where they're on, like, wheels and are going in this loop again and again, and there's, like, an obstacle that can knock them over and the last one standing wins. Um, there's something called, like, horseback riding, which is, like, it's just, like, a, a square with, like, two posts on either end to keep them inside, and then, like, four rotating, like, oblong, like, ovular wheels so that they, it, like, bounces up and down and, like, whoever falls out, <laughs> like, loses. Even though, so it's all randomly generated. It's all just left completely up to random chance which of these colored stick figures finishes first in each round, in each like separate video, separate day, whatever you want to call it. Yep. But in between, <laughs> in between running these programs in Algadoo and simulating this randomness, they add like these skits, these like drawings of the stick figures, like talking to each other as though there's some actual intention behind it. Because, like, as you have more and more players get eliminated, you have a natural emergence of... A narrative. Yeah, a narrative. And this impression that some of them are better than others at, like, <laughs> athletics by pure random chance. There's an emergent narrative 
arising from a set of... I don't even know if it's weighted random number generation. I think it's purely random physics encounters. Yeah. There would be more skill to it in different events if the different little stick figures... And this has, like, a stick fight level of quality to it. Like, they're actually just geometric stick figures. Yes. Uh, if there were properties like weight and speed varied on these stick figures, it would be a lot more like his genetic algorithm stuff. He trains a computer to try to learn how to walk, for instance, in one, or he simulates the progression of a virus. He was on the neural nets shit way before other people were, ranging from evolution simulators to composing jazz to reconstructing photos of people. But the very first one he did of Algica Sathlon was uploaded on November 18th of 2012. So this, with it being weighted in some way, that kind of honestly seems like the next step in evolution for me for Algica Sathlon content. I feel like you could pretty easily <laughs> add sort of random a mod like slight modifiers and say strength speed for different types of rounds between all these different color characters so that some of them may have slight advantages amongst the randomness not enough to guarantee it but enough yeah. to maybe actually give them a slight edge i'd be very interested to see someone try to yeah. make one like this in one sport or another and that would make it similar to his other stuff as well especially if it could modify its own variables if it had sort of an rpg stats uh, breakdown but as it stands, uh, the beauty of Algica Sathlon is it's people reading a narrative into purely random numbers. Right. It is the personification of randomness, like plain and simple. Yes. And I love it. It's so... when I got really invested, actually, in um, Carrie Cage's original like Algica Sathlon video. I got like super into it. I was like rooting for my favorite yeah. color and everything. Oh, absolutely. You, you look at it and you're like... I mean, humans can see personality in anything, as Jeff Winger would say. But it really is crazy how quickly you learn to personify them. How quickly your brain wants to see personality in their actions. Yes. And so what happened, though, was that this Algica Sathalon idea that Carrie Cage created caught on like wildfire. And because it's a free so Algadoo is a free software and it's very easy to use, a bunch of kids just downloaded it and started making their own Algica Sathalon. Sometimes they, you know, are very much direct copies, but a lot of them like add their own sort of original ideas too. There was one I was watching the other day by um, YouTube user Not Scottish. I, I really like their sketches. They actually take some of the variable randomness that happens and really directly reference that like on the first day. Mind you, you're seeing this stuff as it's running in the program. They often speed it up because it takes forever for all the players to be eliminated. <laughs> Yeah, it tends to get slower the fewer characters yeah. there are. And you're seeing it zoomed out as well, so you're not really seeing any one particular character. But on the second day, it was there was this whole plot point about how, oh, lime, as in the color lime, which is like a light green, lime sustained the worst injury in the first round. And it's like it shows the footage back close up, and it's like you see the lime character like hit its head in the ragdoll physics against the bull they land into. And then, <laughs> so the next day, it was like, there's this like developing romance between lime and orange and like orange was like wanting to make sure he was okay. <laughs> and then like a few days later, she tried to call him and his number that he gave her is one, 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 one lime. <laughs> and so she was typing it one, 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 one L I M. And then in the middle of that, I think magenta came up behind her and said, Hey, who are you calling? And she was like, um, um, and it shows a thought bubble. And in the thought bubble, it's like, footage of a google search for words that start with l-i-m and then just every single result was lime like even like the <laughs> That's even really like the meta textual elements and stuff that isn't even like directly the search results <laughs> and it was so funny and so well done and i've never seen like a thought bubble gag quite like that it's, it's like when someone is asked for their name while they're in disguise and they look around the room to come up <laughs> yeah. with a name <laughs> There was a scene in The Amazing World of Gumball where he pretends to be someone else. He looks around the room, he only sees gum and balls <laughs> when he's trying to come up with a name. Yeah, exactly. That's so good. I just love that they even edited the meta text, though, not even just, like, the main search yeah. results. The Google logo turns into the word lime, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that would have been great. Yeah, there's a lot of creativity that people have come up with in regards to like the sketches and even the courses themselves being included in these things. And I've noticed a lot of parallels myself with Algica Sathalon and Go Animate, like those two respective spheres of YouTube. They are both centered around freeware designed for kids. They're both very accessible and easy to create content for, and they've both developed their own niche spheres on YouTube. 
Absolutely. And it seems like the easiest way to find or to uh, generate these sorts of communities is to just make something that is free and runs at like an extremely low uh, hardware computer uh, specs. You know yes, I mean? exactly. If it runs on low hardware specs and it's free, you open up the user base for as many people as possible to be able to make all the dumb things they can think of. Oh, it. totally. Imagine if Kid Picks had been a website. Right? I mean, it's yeah, it's the same story with um, Old School RuneScape is having kind of a moment on YouTube. It's gotten really popular on YouTube the past few years. Uh, Roblox, too. Roblox has an insane amount of child-generated content. Oh, you can... Roblox may be the, the king of this kind of stuff. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. It, I don't think it's free. Um, it's, it's it is free. Uh, there's stuff you can buy that a lot of kids, I guess, get their okay. parents to buy for them. But but it is free. Bobux? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Robux. I remember seeing <laughs> a great comment for a, for a few days. The top comment on never going to give you up was, "Hey, this isn't free Robux." <laughs> I love that. I think it's cool that there's so much software out there for kids to like express their creativity nowadays. I mean, you you know, Absolutely. if you want to talk about like that, there is definitely like concerns with like just them being able to share that out to the internet for anyone to see and how much you know parents do or don't monitor their kids use of the internet like that's an entire issue in and of itself but just that there's more resources for them to express themselves creatively i think is really cool well 90 percent of everything is crap but if you increase the total amount of stuff there is then there's more good stuff too and it's like even if it's crap i just i'm glad that you're like getting to make this stuff you know like i would have killed for Absolutely. some of this stuff as a kid <laughs> Imagine MS Paint, but with, like, four mouse cursors, so you and your friends can co-op it. Right? Like, on the school computers with the chunky, like, iFruit monitors. What are the Mac G3s, that's what I'm thinking of. I've also, it's like, I don't think <laughs> Asathalon's also, like, it's pretty hard to mess up, honestly. I mean, they're they're actually pretty yeah. dramatic and, like, fun to watch. And the music that's, oh, the yeah. music that's always incorporated is, it's very, like, Newgrounds portal music and goes, like, way harder than it has any business going. I remember when I was a kid, there were a lot of YouTube poops that had a surprising amount of narrative consistency and depth to them. Even though the source material was transformed to almost an incomprehensible degree, you could still get a consistent narrative through line. And this seems to be the same type of phenomenon. No matter what you hand kids, they end up telling a story. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And it, it is just like, I think you said it best with the uh, referencing the Jeff Winger speech about the pencil, just this <laughs> amazing human ability to personify literally anything and like the story happening in the mind, like first and foremost. Absolutely. And you give someone the bare bones visuals and then they can tell the story to other people. Yeah, you know, totally. Like I was just thinking too, like even without the included cutscenes in Algic Acethalon, I feel like you could pretty easily imagine your own story. I remember, um, you remember the um, Putt-Putt Joins the Parade game? Yes. There was a, a marble game you could play in the toy store. It was like this pinball machine where you could customize the bumpers where they go and like bounce around all these marbles. I remember I would like assign specific personalities to like different colors <laughs> of these marbles. I think I made them based on like characters from a TV show and I would like try to get some of them to like avoid this other one and be like, oh God, we got to escape from them. And that was literally just like a little like distraction in the main game. That wasn't even a game itself. And I... Yeah. And you have this like whole mental story applied. To yes. It. I yeah. shaped my own narrative around it exactly and it's like i was very struck by how similar it is to algic asapalon <laughs> when i was reminded of that the, yeah i did things like that too it's like you can read a story into anything really it's fascinating i love some of the like really weird characters some people come up with too like there's some that have like transparency in them and they're like a glass player or something <laughs> Actually, yeah, so we were, just before the recording, watching another of Kerry KH's videos. That's uh, C-A-R-Y-K-H on YouTube. And one of his videos was about this website he made called, or this game he made on his website called Elemental 3, which was kind of like Doodle God, except if you combined two elements into an element that didn't already exist, you could suggest a name for it. And then if your suggestion got enough votes, then it would become that combination of two elements. So it exploded in popularity and he drew this really nice, he did this really nice algorithmically constructed uh, graph node tree, which extends upwards like some kind of freaking um, Giacometti sculpture. All these boxes are connected by lines. It's unfolding upwards into the sky. It looks like you'd probably like shred your hand like cheese on it if you touched it. But uh, the point being that the insane amount of user input led to a lot of really funny <laughs> shit posting. <laughs> and it's the same sort of thing. It's Dude. just algorithmic combinations. Oh my god. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt because like I... <laughs> 
but I just had to react audibly to what I'm seeing right now. What's that? Look at this! Algicus Athlon on simple Wikipedia? Why does it- It has a simple Wikipedia article. Okay, so the simple English Wikipedia, uh, by the way, is a largely considered a failed project because its original intent was to summarize regular English Wikipedia articles in a smaller vocabulary set to make them easily understandable for people who speak English as a second language or people with mental disabilities. But that failed because there are certain concepts that can't be broken down into simpler words without losing okay. a See, large amount of detail. I thought it was like actually just on Wikipedia when I saw this. <laughs> No, this is technically a separate form okay. of Wikipedia, whose purpose is to port English Wikipedia into uh, a lower vocabulary register. Even so, it's really funny that this is notable enough to get an article on simple English Wikipedia. <laughs> and let me check, where's the languages tab? This isn't on the regular English Wikipedia. This is only on the simple one. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. so strange. This is like some kid doing this. <laughs> it is. This, this, this is someone, I, that. Look, I don't know who this is, but... Yeah, look at this. It's apparently notable enough for simple English. Great. The Algica Sathalon is a competition in a software called Algadoo, in which various athletes of color compete. I don't think that means what you think <laughs> what it means. Athletes of color? <laughs> oh no! I don't think that... <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh my god. What's the abbreviation oh, AOC? Shit. With one or more athletes eliminated upon oh. completion of each event. I mean, it's not technically wrong. Know, it's just a wider that's variety such of comedy colors. Comedy gold, though, that like they don't, they didn't read into the subtext of like what most people are gonna take that. I, well, I mean, it's on a, la a Wikipedia meant for people who don't speak English. Oh, well, okay, well. So fair. So it may actually just be like a child or a foreigner who's having uh, their best go at that, it. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Ultimately, one athlete will remain and be crowned champion. Many YouTubers have created their own Algica Sathlon variations after Carrie KH's original. The game has definitely evolved, with more and more people getting involved in creating their own series. Derivatives of Algica Sathlon include Algica Deathlon, Alga... Algotria Contathlon, etc. And the infixes in these names refer to the, non the number of events in these multi-sport events. Yeah, and I actually think that Aldecasathlon was one that Kerry KH made before Algicasathlon, but Algicasathlon is kind of the one that stuck most. I, I have to imagine, and the top comments seem to agree, that this would have been a very difficult word for a child to type into a <laughs> search bar at the time. That's a good point, actually, yeah. <laughs> it's like when you set your password to a word you keep misspelling so you spell it correctly eventually. I'll just set my password to the word like deliberately or negligible. Yeah. <laughs> when I was um thinking about this though in relation to like 17776 and like imagining Algica Sathalon as like say a real sport or something, just how <laughs> crazy it is. When you mentioned glass as a as one of the colors, I was imagining like brick and clay and the other elements from the Elemental Three game <laughs> as colors in this game. I love that. So imagine feeding the one into the other, so oh you just have God. algorithmically generated players too. One thing I also encountered was like an, an Algic Sathlon, but it was like country flags instead of colors. So now we're not only yes. we're not only personifying randomness, we're freaking nationalizing it. Well, we're personifying nations, too. You know, whatever humanity does, we keep reinventing Italian. Yes. And so I had this, like, mental picture of, like, people, a bunch of people in, like, a crowded bar, like, going ape shit when their country's flag lands into the, the bowl or whatever in Algica <laughs> Sathalon. And I made that video. That's basically the World's Cup, dude. Right, yeah. The World Cup, yeah. It's basically the World <laughs> Cup. I mean, kids have accidentally, independently re-derived the World Cup. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I've been, like, thinking about where you can go from here, much like I th did with Go Animate. I'm wondering, how can you further push what you can do with Algica Sathalon content? And, you know, we mentioned having variable randomness in uh, the different athletes, like having specific different strength or speed or whatever. 
attack, defense, sustain, release. I think it might be kind of cool if people started putting more sort of like artistic work into some of the obstacle courses. Like you could do like a world tour where like, oh, one of the events is like a pole vault and they're in like Washington, D.C. and they have the pole vault over the Washington Monument, oh. you know? Oh, I thought you meant more like Line Rider where you can make a shape out of the entire track when it's tuned up to music. Oh, you could you could do that this too. This is sure. kind of like Line Rider if you think about it. It is, This yeah. is kind of like Line Rider. There's some overlap There here. definitely is. Yeah, you could do that too. Like there's a lot of... There's there's really nowhere to go but up with this like i just feel like it has so much yes. potential that needs to be explored further i think having chat gpt write the story would not be as satisfying as having no. the actual people write it for what it's worth but you could churn out infinite content that way so. i actually had an idea myself like if i ever want to try to create one of these i had the idea to like try to do like live action cutscenes where like i just wear those like <laughs> one of those like all one color like body suits and just key it out for whatever color i needed to be and impose like faces over them <laughs> not even doing a faces but yeah that would be great so like a green screen body suit and just chroma key it the other color that's fantastic this video you posted peter is like kind of also i was wondering if like, can you imagine an entire, like, live-action recreation of even the athletic parts where you just recreate what the program did? <laughs> and you could, like, show it you would side have by to, side. You would, would you have to, like, superimpose yourself into a fictional environment and have, like, your body ragdolling between the elements of the stage? Kind of like that, like, uh, what was that old Flash game where you have George Bush falling down through the bubble? Yes! You would need, like, one, one of those all-color bodysuits, and you would need a chroma screen of a different color behind you to do this. <laughs> No, no, no. You only need the chroma keys because you can just chroma invert. You can just do everything. Oh, okay. That's key. true. Yeah. Okay. Um, if we have any Algigasathlon fans listening who want to try any of these ideas out that we've spit, um, <laughs> spitballed, please go right ahead. I would love to see some of these tried. You could even use a bodysuit like that to do a bad apple parody in live action. Yeah. <laughs> 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 bad apple cosathlon or something <laughs> bad apple cosathlon jesus christ it's a horribly contorted pun much like purple at the end of the <laughs> <laughs> i've been thinking a lot though about like just with this sort of seemingly endless potential for personification of literally anything and like how far yes can we go with it yeah in the ancient days, it was things like trees being personified as nymphs and uh, nereids uh, from the waves and dryads from the trees and so on. And um, then it became more like, well, forces of nature as well, right, sure. It took a while for people to arrive at the personification of random concepts, though. Yes. And I don't know if the personification of colors predates the modern era. But where are you going with this? Where's the future of it? So I don't know about the future of it, but I had an interesting thought that has occurred to me with regards to, like, you know, people creating Hetalia again and again and again. And this idea of, yeah, like... country ball. Yeah. As well as, like, you know, I've seen, like, you know, the, the lands, the various worlds in um, Homestuck. I've seen fan art of those lands personified as characters. So country ball, country human, and then the the land of something and something yes, the, from Homestuck. Like, or yes, so yeah, like yeah. the land of wind and shade as a character, for example. Oh my god, that's multiple levels deep. And Homestuck is also basically the same thing as Kingdom Hearts, because you have, you know, every character yeah. can be three characters, <laughs> and there's multiple kinds of time travel interfering with itself, and there's mental mindscapes for each character. But it's just multiple layers deep. It's like the Undertale uh, rabbit hole, where uh, AUs of AUs AU of AUs yeah. have complete fan games with entire soundtracks. So something I was wondering, though, about this whole thing with personifying setting... Um, I, it's occurred to me, yes. it's interesting It's interesting to me that, like, I don't think I've often or maybe ever seen, like, an inverse of this, like, trying to design, like, a setting of some kind based on a character, and I have a theory as to why we don't see this as much, if at all. So, what what you're talking about is the opposite of a genius locus, huh? Or a genius loci? I'm not sure what that is. In Roman religion, this was the protective spirit of a place, personifying it. Yes, essentially. And so I think the reason we don't see this kind of thing, like trying to represent a character as a setting, like as a city or a planet or something like that, I think the reason we don't see it is for the same reason that you can scale down a raster image without like any quality loss, but scaling it up causes quality loss. You know, I think the same principle kind of applies. But that said... 
I think it would be really interesting if someone tried it. I want to see, like, what... Wait, 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 wait. Explain that metaphor a bit more. If you scale something down, then you're only taking away pixels. You don't have to add anything to it. And so, likewise, if you're right. taking something that, that at the scale of a world or a city and scaling it down into a person, you're you're not adding anything. Whereas if you take a person or a character and scale that up into the scale of a city or a planet, then you're adding a lot more. And it can be difficult to like add enough to fully flesh that out with just a character. Oh, I, I think I see what you mean. Although, the same way um, that you like that pixels have to necessarily be added if you scale something up and it's losing some quality there. Well, yeah, sure. So the lands of from Homestuck don't necessarily completely encapsulate each character that they represent. It's kind of like, although I was thinking of the, what was it, the Homecoming Saga by Card, where each of 12 people rep uh, goes on to represent a tribe, who each go on to represent a nation, who each go on to represent a planet. It kind of expands outwards over time. Although I get what you're saying, that there is definitely a loss of density of information when you turn a person into a place. Right. So rather than the personification of a place, you'd have the placification of a person. Yes, Would you exactly. call it placification? I was going to say localization, but that's not correct. Yeah, I don't want to say, like, depersonification, <laughs> because, like, that's... That's not correct right. either. That sounds like atomizing someone with a laser beam. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's just interesting to me, though, that we don't see that nearly as often as personification of places. And I'm very curious, like, I would... I'm kind of curious to try it myself or, like, encourage others to try it if they're curious to, like, try to create a location or setting based on a character. This is Columbia, the personification of the United States, uh, prior to the Statue of Liberty and Uncle Sam. And this kind of thing was pretty common at the time, when people were first getting into their heads the idea of a nation itself. It would be interesting to see the sort of inverse of this, definitely. Yeah, yeah, exactly, like an inverse of personification. Phrasing it as an inverse of personification made me think of all those weird deviant art fetishes. <laughs> oh no! I don't know if I should keep that in the episode or not. <laughs> Did you know that if you spread out the human lung over the area of a tennis court, you would die? I mean, I think you'd <laughs> die if you spread it out over the area of, like, a microwave. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> well, just like turning a person into a place, but physically oh, instead of Oh god, a no. <laughs> Like, okay, so, like, I like I think one of the easiest ways to do it would be to adapt some of their, like, physical traits. So, like, if yes. they have, like, a red scarf that they always wear, for example, maybe, like, there would be, like, a long, winding, like, red road throughout this city, for instance. That would make sense. It would. The lamest option is to just interpret the entire population of the place as variants of the person. Yeah. But, like, that, that's no, easy. No, come on. Mode. Yeah, it's, like, exactly. Um, I think the hardest stuff would be to get some of, like, the personality traits and, like, adapt that into, like, the character, the personality of, like, you know, a city. Like, people say that yeah. places, like, have character to them, and I think that would be maybe the hardest thing to adapt. Yeah, you would need to focus on... Personality, would that come through what in what most strongly? Architecture, weather, uh, the landscape itself? Yeah, maybe architecture, weather, even, you know, like, maybe stuff like the economy of the area or something. This reminds me of when we were talking about your uh, defunct... Is defunct the right word? Webcomic? Homesick. Which is uh, Ozzy and Drix as applied to Homestuck. Pretty much, yeah. Brilliant in execution and in intent, might I add. Thank you. And I sent you... One of my characters is a wizard girl who is a drug addict. And so <laughs> the meme I sent you was Ozzy and Drix uh, entering her bloodstream only to find it looking like the industrial park from Spongebob. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. And speaking of which, actually, with that example you gave, I kind of think that setting and character, like, functionally speaking, are kind of the same thing on very different scales in a story. I kind of see what you mean, but elaborate. They can both go through things, like, something can happen to a place, something can happen to a person, and, you know, oftentimes people will talk about places they visit as, like, having character... You know, it's a little hard to elaborate super specifically about this. It's kind of, it's, it seems like the difference between an animal and a plant, because a character is active and a setting is passive. Yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. It's like, they sort of serve similar functions, but one is active and one is passive. I like that. They both interact with the story, and one moves, 
within the other, I guess. Right. But a setting, when destroyed, it it can and does have the same emotional resonance as when a character is killed, for instance. Yes. And by the same token, it is also difficult to create an episode or a story or a movie where a character is born without it getting sappy as it is to have them, say, founding a town without it getting sappy. Very true. <laughs> There are the same pitfalls to navigate yeah. in the beginning and finality of stories uh, of these type. And I've noticed, too, with you brought up my fan comic, Homesick, you know, which basically it's like, it's like you know, all the characters are like single celled and creatures and like viruses and such inhabiting a human as their setting, like playing yes. suburb or a version of suburb from Homestuck. So this is something I've noticed about myself. I'm very interested in stories that have multifaceted story elements, or I guess they would be story compounds at that point. So sto story elements, you know, are things like character, setting, point of view, etc., stuff like that. And so what, what I, when I say, like, story compound, I'm talking about something in a story that is functioning as multiples of these at the same time. So... In Inside Out, for example, Riley is both a character and a setting in that story. I see what you mean. And that's can that can be difficult to do. So would you say that uh, Riley is sort of a placification of a person as well? Yeah, in a way, I would definitely say so, yeah. that. So yeah, that's actually a good example of that, yeah. Or like I was thinking too, like in um in the Owl House, they have some of this with... There are certain things that are serving as both character and item like items that the characters are using like um owl bert or hootie you know which are uh, hootie is both a setting and a, a character yeah yeah exactly he's a house and he's also a character they named this show after the comic release yes. Imagine that. <laughs> and then you know it takes place on the boiling isles which is the deceased carcass of a gigantic titan kind of like bionicle yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, it, no, it's it's one of the most imaginative settings I've seen in a long time. For sure. To not just have an isekai set in a pastiche uh, remix of fantasy medieval Europe, uh, where you have, you know, your vaguely Mediterranean names and your vaguely Slavic names and your vaguely um, uh, Scandic names. Uh, it's a completely separate setting born of the rotting corpse of a fallen god, whose decomposition, even thousands of years later, heats the water to boiling, such that the rain bo is boiling hot. You can't wade into the water without burning. This is a really interesting idea. One that I haven't seen before, except tangentially in Bionicle, because they also live on the corpse of their fallen god daddy. <laughs> yeah. And the way it was done, I mean, there's other continents, which are also the bones of fallen titans. The way they've done that is really interesting. So thank you for pointing that out, that that is reflected in Hootie also being a setting and a character. Because I hadn't realized that symmetry there, that they do that at multiple scales at the same time. Yes. Hootie is a character who is a setting on a character. It, on a character a who's also a setting, yeah. <laughs> That's it's like, wacky. It's just like um, Orteil's Nested that we were also talking about. Oh no! Yeah, tell me. <laughs> this is um, Nested is a widget created by the guy who made Cookie Clicker, which I'm sure we'll talk about Cookie Clicker on the show at some point. Orteil, right? Yeah, I think Orteu is how it's pronounced. It's French for toe. T toe, like on your like on your foot. Yes, like on your foot. <laughs> it's like kid named Finger, but upside down. <laughs> and so, well, yeah, because he's on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. But so, so nested is this weird little widget where it's like you have all these drop down menus that say like universe and you open the menu for universe and it shows a bunch of like galactic superclusters. And if you open one of those galactic supercluster drop downs, you get like different galaxies. If you open one of those, you get solar, you get various solar systems, you'll get planets and then like people, animals, cities, countries, psyche, you know, atoms, quarks. And then it gets to something called a quubble with just cycles back to universe again and it just never ends and it's just this sort of fun weird little interactive like drop down menu that goes on forever and it's got, but it has <laughs> that same kind of implication of like characters and characters and characters this is what everything by david o'reilly will be like in 2015 <laughs>
<laughs> Wait, what is this? This is what No Man's Sky was always meant to be. Oh, everything is a game by David O'Reilly, which is uh, you can jump your soul from object to object and descend down through the scale and up through the scale of the universe in either direction and wrapping back around again, all while listening to beautiful uh, philosophical quotation audiobooks from the philosopher Alan Watts, who was kind of like the Carl Sagan of Buddhism because he served to popularize Zen Taoism and Buddhism here in the West. It's a pretty interesting game. David O'Reilly is incidentally also noted for doing the 3D episode. He was the 3D animator behind the 3D animated episode of Adventure Time. Oh, okay, nice. He, they brought him on as a guest animator. And he is the maker of Octocat, which is one of my favorite pieces of YouTube lore. Oh, I remember Octocat, yeah. And, uh, wrapping back around, full circle, baby, like the universe, Kerry Wong and his brother Michael also made on their website, agetwins.net, the scale of the universe, which is a uh, widget for comparing the scales of different objects in the universe ranging from the cosmological to the atomic. Can you imagine if someone made a mod of that game that worked like nested, so when you zoomed into, like, the quarks and plunk links, it just went into a new universe? <laughs> Exactly. Well, honestly, I recommend everything by David O'Reilly, because then when you play it on Steam, it can, it shows up as like, oh, this guy is playing everything. What? All at once? <laughs> I'll say I would highly recommend checking out more of the Huang brothers' work as well. They're kind of, they yes. have the same reputation as Neil Ciceriga of being what uh, Jan Measley has called a serial one-hit wonder, where... They've made a lot of very noteworthy stuff that a lot of people know about, but few people realize that it's them behind every single one of these projects. A little bit like Neil Ciceriga in yes. that regard. Yeah, the H-Twins are sort of, what did you call them, serial one-hit wonders? That's a great way to describe them. I remember wasting so many hours playing Goime 500 on their website back in the day. Carrie, if you're listening to this, please, please release Goime 500 in HTML5. Please port it. I don't want to have to load up Flashpoint every, one I, every time I want to relive it. <laughs> if Battle for Dream Island is not taking too much of your time, that is. You know, putting, putting drama on a weighted random number generator is probably taking up a lot of time. <laughs> Yes. But yeah, so that's just something I've been noticing about my personal taste in media. I really like these stories that employ story elements in conjunction to create story compounds in which a feature of the story is functioning as multiples of these at a time. It's almost economical in a sense. I, I, I really do like stories yeah. with an economy of character. For a long time, I had the idea of writing a story that had exactly three characters and no more because I had seen a bunch of memes where people would make the cover art for Demon Days by Gorillaz but replace the characters from Gorillaz with the characters from another show or series. And I figured, well, if you only have three characters, you can't make a Demon Days meme. So, ha. Huh. But then I saw one of Steamed Hams, which only has two characters, uh, Skinner and Chalmers, so I realized it was a futile attempt anyway. Yeah. People will inevitably find a way to make a meme about it. It does make me wonder, though, how many more combinations are there? Because I feel like something functioning as both character and setting is one of the most common story compounds. Yeah, you can have someone living on or in someone else that is also something else. There was that episode of My Life as a Teenage Robot where the mice inhabit Jenny. Yeah. That sort of thing. I guess that she counts as a setting. I don't know. Or like any story where they go into the purpose of that a episode, submarine and shrink. Any episode setting, of yeah. anything where they go into a little submarine and shrink down and go into someone's body to correct a problem from the inside. What is that? Fantastic Journey? Like Fantastic any plot voyage. like that is a character in a set. Fantastic Voyage. That's a set of, uh, uh, setting character. Story. Yes. And so like it just has me thinking what other combinations like how would you make like something in a story that's like both a setting and a point of view or like both a character <laughs> and a tent or something like that you know <laughs> like a setting and a point of view okay what like I don't know I don't had... know if there's answers to some of these some of these might not actually be possible but it's like I just want to encourage people to think about it cuz it's I want to see someone try you know the episode of Rick and Morty where they keep splitting timeline by mistake and it yes. like tears the screen in half? Is that setting and point of view at the same time? Ooh, that's actually, yeah, that's not because bad. Because each, each, each timeline can only see what it can see, but they can interact with each other with the gun with the portal gun on it. Yeah, that's actually, that's a good point, actually, yeah. Or what if you had, for example, um, it kind of reminds me of the concept of Umwelt, which is the idea that your senses determine your environment. And this is a concept, I think, in like biopsychology, I guess you'd call it. So, for example, a snake lives in a different world from a mouse because a snake has heat sensing pits. At least pit vipers do. Uh, so they have, because of that extra sense, the world they inhabit is informed by that sense. And thus it is completely or at least functionally distinct from the world that the mouse inhabits. And incidentally, heat sensing infrared cameras 
can't see anything that is colder than themselves, I think it is. So if you heat up an infrared camera, then it goes blind. You don't even have to, like, paintball the lens. That might be... What I was thinking of is, let's say you have two characters who are sort of out of phase with each other, or they're, like, from different dimensions from each other. There was an episode of Regular Show called Sugar Rush, I think it was called, or Sugar Crash. It was sort of an Inception parody, but without the dreams. So they go and get some double-glazed apple fritters. It sends them into such a sugar rush that they uh, transcend to another layer of reality where they're moving at normal speed, but everything else is in slow-mo. And they do this again. I think they do it three-stack. And they go into this, like, terrifying dark dimension where everything is frozen solid and there's almost no light to see by. <laughs> but they're moving at, like, bullet train speed relative to the rest of the world, and no one can see them. They're basically invisible. And there's a video game called Eversion by Guillermo... I think it is. Guillermo del To, who uh, basically set out to make uh, Super Mario Bros. 3 as if it were made by Lovecraft. And so at certain <laughs> points in each level, your little flower guy, ZT, can evert reality and transcend to the next layer of reality. And with each layer everted, uh, the walls peel off the stage and everything gets a little stale and demented and eventually demonic. But it tells a really convincing story in the process. It is a really compelling example of gameplay and narrative through gameplay. Because through it all, ZT's not phased at all. And it seems to be the point and that this is the way it's meant to be. With that in mind, that could absolutely be an example of setting as point of view, because the mechanics of the game change on every aversion layer. On some of the layers, clouds mm, are transparent yeah. and you can't stand on them. On other layers, the clouds are walkable platforms and you can get to other aversion points that you weren't able to access before. You can get to other platforms in the area. In some layers, eventually, for example, the trees that block your way shrivel up and die and then you can get by them, but in their place, in uh, further on, uh, barbed wire grows and you can't get past that without getting hurt and the enemy's behavior changes they slow down they come to a stop at which point you can't bypass them and then they speed up again and their behavior randomizes and you get these clawed hands jumping out of the ground and it makes me wonder what would this game look like in multiplayer if you had two oh, ZTs on the game at the same time, would they be able to see each other if they were on different aversion layers? I did. That reminds me of a story idea I had years and years ago about this worm-like like interdimensional creature that looked different to everyone who saw it. And depending on who was with it, it would have different abilities because of like how everyone perceived it differently. That makes sense to me. I have a similar creature in my stories uh, called an Ostium Worm which can biogenically generate a door between worlds. But it just uses this to steal corpses from graves on Earth. That also, um, that regular show episode you mentioned also reminded me of, there's an episode of Chowder where, not heeding Mungdal's warning, he eats this super sour fruit that you're not supposed to just eat straight. I remember this! And, and it makes him pucker so hard that he, like, gets sucked into his own mouth. <laughs> And then his own mouth is, like, the size of an amphitheater. Yeah, and it's, like, a black hole, like, on the outside. And there's, like, this joke where he sees, like, the thing he ate in his mouth, and he eats it again, and then it just falls from the ceiling, and he eats it again, and it <laughs> falls back from the ceiling. <laughs> Classic. Classic. That show was so good. Yeah, but so it just makes me think, too, like, how many possible combinations can you have of combining different story elements you know, like, can you have, like, three at once? Four? Like, like, what could you possibly do? And it's like, I don't know if... I'm sure there's a you hit a wall at some point where you can't really do something, but... I think if you wanted to have item and setting and character and setting, you inve inevitably need multiple scales of character. Yeah, I mean, you could have item and character and setting be the same thing if you had a talking crystal ball that was also a planet to microbes living upon True. it. True. Yeah. But you would need to have multiple scales of character. And that's basically Horton Here's a Who. Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> and I also, I wonder about it for the more abstract story elements like tense, you know, past tense, present tense. Like, how can you combine that with something? <laughs> well, one example I can think of is the book uh, Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World by Haruki Murakami, which is a, I guess I would call it a cyberpunk novel, but a lot of it is extremely surreal. It feels to me like it was written from a dream log. The narrative is two intertwining narratives that reflect each other. One is set in our world, ostensibly, where this guy has the two halves of his brain surgically divided, or something like that. He has split brain, uh, and 
he uses this ability. He works for a company that launders mathematical data in order to encode it and encrypt it and keep it secure for a select clientele. He's employed by this doctor who's, in, who's uh, experimenting how to read the sounds out of bones. And, well, that's very important data. If you could get the sounds out of bones, then you wouldn't need to interrogate anyone. You could just kill them and then skeletonize them and read the data from their skull. Uh, so that data is very much worth encoding and encrypting. So while that's going on, there's also another setting entirely called the end of the world, which at first I thought was m maybe his distant descendant. So it takes place in a city called the end of the world, which is this walled city surrounded by rolling golden fields. Uh, there are unicorns out in the fields and in the winter they come in and the elderly ones die. And then this main character, the librarian, reads the dreams out of their skulls. And there's this very deliberate symmetry between the two narratives, and they wind between each other like a double helix. The really interesting part is the way it was translated. I don't know precisely how it is in Japanese. It was originally written in Japanese. Alfred Birnbaum translated this to English in 1991. The hard-boiled Wonderland segments are written in past tense, and the end of the world segments are written in present tense. And it really distinguishes the two. Like, you notice, it feels very different. Oh, you know what? Now that you mention it, there is a short story I wrote that played with, like, tense shifting like this. Yes, I've, I've tried this in several of my stories as well, to change the tense of the writing depending on who the point of view character is. So I think tense and POV is entirely possible. What I did, um, I'm not sure what it's combining per se. Maybe it's honestly, maybe like tense and setting, weirdly enough. But I had a story about, it was on another planet and there were these people who were able to manipulate time, speed it up or slow it down. And so... They basically used this to their advantage and built a city, like, fortress around themselves, and they basically speed up everything around them inside the city and progress much, much faster than everyone outside of it. And they basically, you know, they oppress everyone else in this area, right? And so it follows, the story follows the main character who tries to go and infiltrate them and basically get information from them. But so when he's, like, outside in his little village and, like, planning to infiltrate the fortress it's all in past tense but then i have this point where like he crawls sort of underground like into the city and when like top half of his body like reaches the inside of of the threshold the blood in his top half like pumps like a lot faster than the blood in his bottom half and it makes him like really lightheaded and he has to like basically crawl the rest of the rest of the way in and pass out but i have this moment where it shifts there from being in past tense <laughs> to present tense to reflect that he's in the area now where time is sped up and then it, and then it goes back to past tense again when he leaves i really like that it kind of reminds me of the scene from james and the giant peach where he's crawling through the peach in silhouette and he slowly transforms he doesn't slowly transform. Yeah. There's a sort of magical sparkle screen wipe where he turns from a live action character to a claymation. Yeah, figure. and it's, it's beautifully done because it's just his silhouette, so it like looks seamless yes. when it happens. Lit up by candlelight yeah. through the peach flesh. There are a couple stories that like like this that really resonate with me. Uh, the Indian in the cupboard, for instance, or the Lego Movie, even Sausage Party to an extent. I haven't seen that. Oh movie, yeah, admittedly. but it does this really clever thing where the you know, it's a Seth Rogen movie, so, you know, the, the you can see the vegetables and fruit talking when you're high, right? Yeah. But, dude, weed, Lamau. But <laughs> when, when up to that point, there is a separation of the two worlds involved that is entirely perceptual. Right. And the way they went about it, I'm, I've been looking for a story that does this particular concept really well for a long time. This idea of, like, an evil heaven, or, like, the, the how would you say it, like, the subversion version of an afterlife, I suppose. I don't know how you would particularly describe it, because it's so hard to nail down. Yes. Someday I'll figure out, and I might have even mentioned it in a previous episode, someday I'll figure out how to phrase it so I know how to look for what I want. But it it's a very particular feeling, and I need to find it. Uh, I was thinking about, um, what if you made one of these, like, character is a setting stories for Algic Sathalon? So <laughs> the little, like, the spinning bumpers they're had personalities these, like, too? They're going through the character's, like, digestive system as an obstacle course or something. <laughs> No, the other way around. So, like, the spinning bumpers are characters, and the horses and the carts are characters. Oh, okay. I was so they're just like, you know, eh, it's a living. 
<laughs> I was thinking about like having it be like they go through their digestive tract or like neurology or something <laughs> like inside oh. them. <laughs> Ozzy and Drix Athlon. No, it actually that's so funny because now that you mentioned it, when you mentioned Line Rider, I there was a Line Rider clone I played a lot called Free Rider. There was one of the um vehicles you chose, which is this square, this rounded corner square block. And I did a course in that game that was just like the digestive system. <laughs> and like you felt that's through really it. good. That's funny. Oh, oh, I wanted to mention that um Geometry Dash is also extremely rich for user created content these days. It's really? experiencing a boom. Yeah, no, there are some insane levels with Geometry Dash. Nice. I guess some, um, yeah, I guess a, a lot of rhythm games are like that. Uh, my f personal choice, A Dance of Fire and Ice, has a lot of really cool custom content. I, oh, I just did a search on YouTube for Geometry Dash insane level, and there really are some crazy ones. Oh, who was the one that I saw? Because there was a particular user that a, uh, a, f a friend of ours... Uh, is a POV of... your dashed geometries is <laughs> there wait there's a <laughs> your a dashed PO... geometries is uh <laughs> non-renderable hyphen <laughs> D dash uh so, wait, yeah so mr dweller is mr dweller's, mr. dweller's kind of point of view and character i guess so i guess <laughs> no, <he's> so. Not. <laughs> no no i can see that you, was like a shit post you, comment <laughs> you of all people i could see making that argument though <laughs> uh, SPU seven NIX. So I guess it's pronounced Sputniks. Uh, Sputniks is had, has done some crazy, insane geometry dash levels. So far as I've seen, uh, there are a bunch of other people who do really crazy levels as well. But I've only seen the ones from Sputnik so far because I don't actually play the game. It's just more. It's fun to watch someone at the top of their game. I tend to think that playing a video game at a certain point goes from playing a game in the sense of, like, playing football or sports or something, to playing as in music, like playing a performance. There's a certain level of skill where you reach the transition from uh, we're just looking for the goal, we're scoring the points, to we're performing the game. Oh, yeah. No, I totally understand what you mean. It's two different senses of play occurring at two different scales. Again, like 1770-76. Yes. <laughs> what if the tornado in seventeen seventy seventy six had a personality too? Oh hell yeah, dude! Are you kidding? <laughs> that would be awesome. I feel like personified weather is—it's so old it should be new again. <laughs> yeah, personification, multifaceted story elements—really cool stuff. Um, I just I want to encourage our listeners to think about this stuff, like, because I mean, I'd love to hear if you guys get inspired to create like. You know, it's like inverse personification, creating a setting or something based on a character. <laughs> Try to like really gauge the limits of what can be personified. Like really think in the abstract. Oh yeah, and then also just like different, think about different ways to combine interesting story elements. Go think about all that and report back to me if you get inspired by something <laughs> from it. Definitely. Algica Sathalon is, I think, still very productive. There's still a lot of room for it to be uh, innovated on. You Absolutely. You tie a lot more of these strange ideas in. You know what's really funny is, one of the top results right now at least, you search Algico Sathlon, the username that comes up here at the top is just GREEN, in all caps, spaced apart, exclamation point. And <laughs> Algico Sathlon Day 18, only five days ago. But the background of the thumbnail is one of the chicks from Total Drama Island. It's like, <laughs> I wonder how many kids who do this grew up grew, uh, watching that show. Too, oh, it, dude, I'm sure. Thing. Are you kidding? There's 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 a lot of crossover between the t Total Drama Island fandom, the Battle for Dream Island fandom, the Algica Sathlon fandom. All of these are survivor format shows where someone gets voted off and uh, different people compete in events in order to determine a hierarchy. There's infinite drama here. There's infinite room for content generation. Yes. I think um, Algica Sathalon in 3D would be even more interesting as well. I think uh, there's a lot of room for variety in presentation as well. Of course, there's something to be said for the simplicity of the format in the genre, because you've got this very uh, anthill schematic view, where everything's sort of a wireframe diagram with... Uh, the stick figures navigating through this strange maze of hell and death. But uh, what would it be like in 3D? What about four-dimensional Al Algica Sathalon? Yeah. Tesseract Sathalon. So, so you have like six different views of a hypercube, <laughs> and the characters can walk between them through the fourth dimension. Yeah, no, I'd that. love that. That would be crazy. So yeah, That'd definitely crazy. Um, thank you, Peter, for joining <laughs> me today. This was really fun. 
Flatland Osathlon. Flatland Oh my god. And yes, to all of you listeners, um, let us know if uh, you came up with any interesting ideas from this. We'd love to hear them. Hell yeah. I'm PDB, and this is my buddy Vela. And you are listening to Thick Tan, signing off.